Good morning. How are you this morning? Good deal. If you are a guest of our wonderful town for the Apple Festival this weekend, welcome to our chaos. <laughs> Traffic isn't usually this bad, um, but if you are in town and you have not been down there yet, um, apple cider donuts are basically snowflakes from heaven, and you should get those. Um, apple cider slushies are the rainfall mixed in the snow from heaven. And then any brand of apple from our side of the world is better than anything you've ever eaten. Amen? It's good stuff. And if you're a local, you know that you're completely avoiding the Apple Festival this weekend. <laughs> right? We get it, we get it, we get it. But we do love it. We love our town. We're glad you're here this morning. We're in a series entitled Letters to Leaders. We started uh, this series last week. And just by way of introduction, I want to uh, sort of remind you a little bit of last week. H hang on one second. I'm going to call a timeout. Um, this is my timeout. Um, a lot of us come in on a Sunday morning, and things look good, and the sound is good, and the, the cameras, and the, everything just working just great. This morning, the enemy absolutely attacked, and anything that could go wrong, I think went wrong this morning. So I want to say thank you to our worship team, to our AV team back there in the back. They do an amazing job every single week. They do. They're, they're kind of like offensive linemen on a football team. The only time you recognize them is when something goes bad. But, uh, but they've done amazing today. And this team up here, I'm telling you, up until 10 minutes before church started, we weren't sure anything was going to work. So uh, thank you, Jesus, for removing the demons of the airways and uh, allowing us to work this morning. So with that being said, let me jump into this series. It's called Letters to Leaders. Um, the Apostle Paul, if you don't know who that is, I would encourage you to go back and listen to last week's message to kind of get the intro of this. Um, the Apostle Paul is who we credit with the writing of the majority of what we call our New Testament in our Bibles. Um, he wrote letters to churches and, and letters to address difficult things in different places. But three particular letters in the New Testament of our Bible, he wrote to leaders. Um, it's the books of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So over the next few weeks, this series that we're going to dig through is out of those books. We're going to use some other scriptures, of course, to support, but they're kind of built out of that. Now, some of you that came in this morning, you weren't here last week, and you came in and you said, oh, cool, letters to leaders. I'm not a leader, so therefore I don't have to listen from here on out. Um, well, if you were here last week and you remember, I told you that there is a Greek word for those of us who think we're not leaders. That Greek word is... <laughs> All right? It doesn't exist. Um, you're always leading some, someone. If you're a parent, um, if you're a grandparent, if you're somebody who goes to a job, um, if you have somebody who's younger than you, and that's everybody in the room, okay? There's somebody that we're leading. Matter of fact, one of the things we said last week is we're all leading someone <laughs> somewhere. Uh, we are. We're all doing that. So uh, that was last week. This morning in the second part of this, we're going to dig in to um, a next sort of an idea that the Apostle Paul was teaching and something that I want us to learn. I'm going to kind of open it this way. And if you want to follow along, um, you can scan those QR codes, the little magnets in the chairs in front of you. That'll take you to our church website. And you can go to sermon notes and all the sermon notes, everything we do this morning will be downloaded. Um, otherwise, you can look up on the screen if you've got a Bible or your phone. I'm going to ask you to use your phone a little bit later on for something you can do this week, but if you want to do that and follow along, you're more than welcome to. But I want to give you a statement kind of as we start this morning. It's this, if you're going to be a leader, if you're going to be a leader, um, this seems kind of obvious. Um, you need to know where you're going. You need to know where you're going. If you're going to lead someone, you need to know where you're taking them and what's the ultimate destination of where you're going to go. So it, it leads me to this question, what does it take to, uh, to know where you're going? What does it take to know? Uh, my wife and I, uh, we've been married 32 years, I think we figured out the other day. We've been married 32 years. We love to, we love to take road trips. Anybody like to drive? You like to drive? All right, real, real quick, as I get going, how many of you would rather get on an airplane, get to the destination, and get going? Is that you this morning? Cool. All right. How many of you like to drive and see things along the way? 
Is that okay? Cool. This M- Missy and I love to do that. Now, if we're going to the other end of the world, planes sound good. Um, I, you know, that that's cool. But we like to drive places. It's kind of cool. Over the last, um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, as as you can, you know, get cell service just about anywhere in the world. Um, a lot of times when I'm driving, Missy's Googling. Um, as we go through a town, as we see something, we've driven out to Texas and back before, to the other side of Texas before, and then driving out there, you go through acres and acres and miles and miles and miles, and there's windmills. So Missy started looking those up, and she's always Googling. She's always looking at different towns we go through, things that we see, if we see a monument, and she'll read to me. I'm, I'm a history and geography kind of a goofball, so she'll do that. So we all have our assignments. We have things that we do on these, uh, on these road trips as we take them. But we have to, when we're talking about being leaders, we have to ask this question, what does it take to know where we're going? Let me, let me give you a couple of essentials, and then I'm going to jump into the scripture this morning. Here it is. The first thing we need is we need a road map. Now, for anybody under about 25, um, uh, road maps are things we used to have to look at. Um, we used to have to fold them out. They're impossible to fold back the way that you bought them originally, Right? Um, And then they would come out with the atlases that would would show you the maps. And if you're going from one state to the other, there's inevitably a crease down the middle of the highway. And you don't know where your exit. Anyway, you would do that. But now we all carry these million-dollar little machines in our pockets, don't we? Um, And we use GPS. We use GPS for everywhere. GPS is used so often that you can depend so much on your phone that you can be driving to a destination. And when you're pulling up to the destination, you can see the entrance sign to the restaurant. But the GPS hasn't told you to turn yet. So you'll go past the entrance because the GPS hasn't told you to turn yet. So the idea of if we're going to go somewhere, we've got to have a road map, or to put it in today's term, a GPS, to know where we're going. The other thing we would need is we would need directions. We would need directions. There we go. We jump back in. Our GPS tells us directions of where we're going. And if we're going to lead people somewhere, we kind of need to know what it looks like. We need directions. And then we need some, um, we need some essentials. Now, I brought some of our road tripping essentials this morning. And if you're anything like us, if we're going to get in the car for a little while, there are some absolute essentials that must be done. First off, I have to have a Diet Dr. Pepper. Um, I have to. It's, it's just a needed thing. I have to do that. Um, I need, um, for when I'm about three quarters of the way done with the Diet Dr. Pepper, I have something to spit in. I need sunflower seeds. Any sunflower seed lovers out here? Anybody like sunflower seeds? Anybody like sunflower seeds? Here we go, sweetie. Sunflower seeds for you, all right? You can have those, all right? Um, check mix. Yeah, all right? That's an essential, right? You got to have check mix if you're going to travel. Anybody like check mix? Any check mix? If I can hit you, Nathan, we're going to give it a shot, all right? There you go, buddy. All right, there we got. all right? Um, my wife loves these sour patch things. I'm not because my lips curl up. And it's a little bit ridiculous, but Sour Patch Kids, who, who likes Sour Patch Kids? Boy, I saw double hands right back there. Got them. Look at that. That was pretty cool, all right? Um, I like peanut M&Ms. Now, now, these are essentials, amen? These are absolute essentials. Now, I have to be careful about throwing these because we have peanut allergies in the world today. So, Mark Lynch, I saw you stand up. So, Mark, I don't have the arm to get them back to you. So, will you move down this aisle just a little bit for me, Mark? It'll help me out. Oh, Mark, you messed up now, buddy. Come on, sweetie. Come here, sweetie. There you go. Sorry, Mark. She's cuter than you, buddy. There you go. Have at it, all right? Um, Now, I'm giving you my essentials. This is the stuff we've got to have. A few years ago, Reese's absolutely lost their mind and started making white chocolate Reese's cups. So my wife and I, we usually get the big pack and split them, but I only found a two pack this morning. But these, these are some of our essentials. Uh, white chocolate Reese's cups. White chocolate. Right, you just had a baby. You're getting to get these white chocolate Reese's cups, all right? I'm not going to hit the baby, all right? Here we go. Good job. All right, good job. Um, now, this is going to be old school, okay? Because I have to have these. These are called caramel creams. They're the caramels with the little white. We don't know what the white product is. Um, it could be nuclear waste. It could, we're not exactly sure what it is. But this is an absolute essential for me. Patrick's going to lose his mind if I don't give him something. Um, so he got those. And then because I was born in America, amen, 
I got, Amer- I got red, white, and blue flowing through me. My last essential when we travel is a giant Slim Jim. Amen? Yeah, I appreciate y'all wanting this, but it ain't happening. All right? That's staying right there. All right? All right? Cool. All right. Oh, I forgot one other thing. I love strawberry blow pops for some reason right at the end. Oh, she got the first hand up. See if we get it. Oh, it went too far. Pass it back up. Don't you be a thief in church. Pass it right back up. Good job. All right. Those are essentials. I don't know what your essentials are. Now, what's crazy is Missy and I could have stopped at Outback and split a meal for the amount of money that it costs me at a gas station to buy those essentials. But those are essentials that you have to have. And then let me give you the last thing that you have to have. We have to have a set of beliefs to guide us where we're going to be going. See, if you're going to go somewhere, if you're going to lead somebody, you have to believe that you're going to ultimately get there, that the GPS is taking you to a place that you're going somewhere. If you're going to lead someone, In this life, if you're going to lead someone, you've got to have a set of beliefs to guide you where you're going to take, where they need to be. So let let me give you some some words from the Apostle Paul. In in the first letter that he wrote to the leaders is in the book of 1 Timothy. And if you have a Bible and want to turn there, you can. Otherwise, it'll be up on the screen or you can, again, scan that QR code and follow there. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, again, he's writing to Timothy and he says this. He says, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, so Paul is traveling all over Asia Minor, kind of the known world at that time. He says, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, another city, so that you may command certain people, now now listen to these words, not to teach false doctrine. So what's happening in the city of Ephesus is there is a church that is set there. And Paul has gone in with Timothy, who is the local pastor, the local elder that is there, and they are teaching sound doctrine. They are teaching the truth that Jesus told that is in what we had at the time, or what they had at the time, Scripture, and then what we now have now. He's teaching the truth. And Paul is telling Timothy, you've got to counteract those that are teaching false doctrines. And he says, don't let them do it any longer. At the end, at the beginning of verse 4, he says, or to devote themselves to myths and to endless genealogies. Now, myths and endless, endless genealogies in, in our world, um, we kind of think about, you know, what are, what are we talking about? But remember, I said this last week, and again, you can go back and listen if you want to. When you are reading scripture, meaning was to the original, looking at it and trying to apply it to your life, you have to figure out what the original meaning was to the original hearers. Well, in those days, there were people who would constantly take one idea of Uh, Judaism or one idea of Christianity and they would take it all the way through and they would begin to add other beliefs to it and they just begin to become myths. And then there were people that were stuck into if you're not from Abraham, if you're not from Jacob, if you're not from this particular person. So they would endlessly go back and look at the genealogies and they would try to prove their worth based off of who they relate, were related to. So Paul is individually saying to Timothy, you need to be careful about these people to devote it. How does that look into today's world? I think it looks like people who... Um, People who try to major on things that they shouldn't major on. So I I want you to think about this before I go on to the next verses. Um, There are a lot of denominations who call themselves Christian. Let me just give you a couple. A a Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist. um, And of course, if you go into Baptist, you got 17 kinds of Baptists. And and you can run into those. Um, uh, Some Catholics call themselves Christians. Um, We can go to Episcopal. We can go to Reformed. Um, There's a bunch of different ones of them. And the crazy thing is, um, each denomination, uh, Pentecostal, there's another one that I forgot to throw out. Um, There's a bunch of them. We call ourselves Christians. Each denomination has their own little different way of how they believe. Y'all understand that, right? You do understand that? Like, if, if you go to a Pentecostal church, one that maybe speaks in tongues, or, or they want to get up and shout, and, you know, there's one lady with a tambourine, and she likes to run around the church, and that's just the way they believe. There's nothing wrong with it. 
I just hope she has rhythm. That would be fantastic. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, there are uh, Methodists who have certain ways of doing things. There's certain uh, Christian groups that, like we are, we're Baptist. Um, when you pull those things back, we baptize by immersion because the word baptism means immersed. It means you're fully under the water and you identify with the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. But there are some Christians that they think baptism is okay and you can be sprinkled and that's fine. It's, it's all right. Wet's wet. As long as you're identifying with Jesus, that's cool. And by the way, baptism is not a prerequisite to being a Christian. It's an obedience to Jesus, but it doesn't get you to heaven. And if anybody wants to argue with me, let's just talk about the thief on the cross. So anyway, you know, he didn't have to go, today I'll be with you in paradise, let me get baptized real quick. It didn't work out that way. So again, all these different denominations, we go in different ways, and what happens so often (laughs) is we all think we're right. Y'all got any family members like that? Yeah. We're about to hit into the holiday season. Some of you are going to sit around a Thanksgiving table with the relatives that you haven't seen since last Thanksgiving. And, and listen, if you really want to have a great meal, just, I mean, opening conversation, you should go, what do y'all think about the election next time? <laughs> Let it eat. All right? There's all these, we all have different opinions. I, I, I think when it comes to denominations, I don't think God's a denominational person. I do think denominations are okay because it allows people to worship in different ways. But I think when we get dogmatic in, in minor things and say, well, if you don't do this, you're not, you're not a Christian, I think we're messing up. So to use that word correctly, what happens is when you get stuck in these myths and endless genealogies is that you're majoring on really kind of minor things. Um, So let let me move on. The end of verse 4, Paul says to Timothy, he says this, Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. So what he's saying is this, I want you to major on the major things. The things that promote, let, let me put it into today's world, and you probably know some of these people. I am sure there are none of you here that are the people that I'm getting ready to speak of, but you probably know some people who have been to 27 different churches in their lifetime and every one of them has been wrong because they go into one and they find something they don't like and they say well I'm going to go over to this one because they made me mad and then they go over to this one and they don't like this one and they go over to this one they don't like this one and they go over to this one and it continues to be this constant cycle in their lives and all they're doing is just promoting confrontation and, and controversy and they're saying instead of saying I'm going to get plugged in somewhere and, and guess what I don't know if you know this about us but let me just put this in a vernacular you'll completely understand we ain't perfect, all right? So if you decide that this is the church that you want to be a part of, Kyle's going to announce in a little bit that we have an ownership class coming up in just a couple of weeks. That's part of becoming an owner. We call our members owners here. If, if you decide this is the church I want to be a part of and I'm going to plug into it, just go ahead and know that Kyle and I, we are co-pastoring this church And I want you to know, in the the nine months that I have been co-pastoring with Kyle, I have discovered that he makes mistakes. I don't know what he's learning about me, but I know. We're imperfect people. Our staff members are imperfect. Our church is imperfect. There are things, listen, what, what, what Paul is trying to say is this. Don't get stuck on these little things. Find a place, get involved, be a part of what God has for you. Let me, let me keep going. Verse 5, and I love this. Paul says these words. He says, the goal of this command, the goal of this command to refute false doctrine, to do these things, to, to not promote these controversies, to lead people where they need to go, the goal of this is this. Ooh, I like this. The goal of this command, will y'all say that word for me? Love. Love. The word love just makes me calm. (laughs) You see, I I, I grew up in the kind of churches that told me, don't love those people. Those people are outcast. You can't love them and be a follower of Jesus. And my my soul would stir and just go, but wait a minute. God said he's love. Now, now God's going to judge. We'll we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, But that's up to God. It's my job to love. And Paul says the command to this is love. And then he says these words. He said it comes from a pure heart. Uh, A pure heart is is it comes out of the right motivation. A good conscience and a sincere 
faith. I, I'm going to spend some time talking about this sincere faith, but I want you to understand what a good conscience is. A conscience is this innate, um, uh, God-given ability for, in all of us to make moral judgments. Now, when he says, do this out of a good conscience, he's saying, make the right kind of judgment in this situation. Do you realize that we can all be blood-bought sinners of following Jesus by God's grace, and we can disagree on some things? Did y'all know that? Did y'all know that there are some things that people try to separate other Christians from? And really what it is, is just a, well, there, there's one a particular uh, writer that I follow. And he gave a wonderful statement several years ago. He said, there ought to be closed-handed issues when it comes to our faith. There are some things that when it comes to being a Christian, if you do not believe these particular things... I'm going to go ahead and tell you, and God will tell you, you're not a Christian. And then there's some open-handed things. Some open-handed things are all kinds of things. I mentioned one a few minutes ago, whether or not you speak in tongues in a church or not, whether or not you believe in a prayer language or not, whether or not you say um, it's okay to drink alcohol versus it'll send you straight to hell. There's all these different things that you may view, predestination versus election versus um, choice versus, there's all these, there are some close-handed things which is where I'm going to spend the next few minutes. I want you to get this. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to use several scriptures. And if you've never taken notes before in church, I would encourage you to take notes. Um, if you don't want to take notes, I would encourage you to either snap a picture of what's coming up on the screen or go to the website and just download it. All the notes are already on there. But I want you to get these because I believe if you'll understand these, you will take a step in your faith or maybe this morning, you're somebody that's not sure about Jesus. You're not sure about your faith. You'll hear one or two of these things that I'm talking this morning and you'll go, man, I'm not sure I fully believe that. You need to. Because this is what it is to be a faithful follower of Jesus. This is the kind of doctrine that Paul wants us to understand. Let me give it to you. And like I said, I'm going to use a bunch of different scriptures. But before I do, let me give you these last couple of verses in 1 Timothy. It's this. Paul says, some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law. They want to stand up and tell you what you need to do and don't need to do. But they don't know what they're talking about. I, I love the bluntness of scripture. They don't know what they're talking about. Or what they so confidently affirm. I know a lot of people who are confidently wrong. So let, let me spend these next few minutes, um, and, and I'm going to give you eight things. So if you're somebody that goes, man, there's only 15 minutes left on the clock. I know church is supposed to end at 12 because he just said that you guys are kind of Baptist, and if you're Baptist, you got to get out at 12, and the Apple Festival is going on, and now he just wasted 15 more seconds explaining what he's getting ready to explain. So I'm going to do my best. I'm going to run through eight things. So if you're counting down, you'll be able to get them, all right? These are eight things that you have to believe. This is, this is non-optional. You have to believe if you're going to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Number one, Jesus is God's son. In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you, you're no longer Simon, your name is Peter. And on this rock, now, don't get confused. Don't think that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on Peter. There's an entire group of people for hundreds and hundreds of years that have tried to take this statement and say, oh, that meant that Jesus was building his entire faith on Peter. No, what Jesus was saying was this, on that statement you made, Peter, saying that I am the son of the living God, that's what I'm building my church on it, and the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not overcome it. So you have to believe that Jesus is God's son. If you don't believe that, and if you have any doubt of that, you need to settle that faith inside of you. This is one of the doctrines that, that the apostle Paul was telling Timothy, you got to make sure people understand this. That's number one. Number two is this, that Jesus came to illustrate and to demonstrate what God is like because Jesus was and is God. 
Now, I would like to take about the next, I don't know, seven or eight hours and explain to you the doctrine of the Trinity. But if I tried, I'd mess it up. See, we believe in a God who is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. They exist all together at the same time in perfect community and perfect fellowship. And we have to understand that when Jesus came to this earth, this was God stepping out of heaven in, in, in the, the form of a man in flesh to become the Son of God, but he was God. John 14 says this, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where we're going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. What do you mean? You're the, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who's seen the Father, who has seen me, has seen the Father. Huh. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Jesus is God. He is the Son of God and he is God in the flesh. You have to believe that. That is proper doctrine. And you may be sitting here going, well, I didn't know that. Well, now you do, <laughs> all right? It's, it's time to take that step. It's time for those of us who call ourselves Christians. And if you're not a Christian this morning, you're a little bit off the hook. I'm not telling you you have to know this stuff. But if you are a Christian this morning, you, you need to stop saying, well, I don't, I don't know. Nope, it's time to know. It's time to take the next step. It's time to take the baby steps. It's time to learn. It's time to grow in your faith. Number three, mankind is sinful and cannot save his or herself. You cannot save yourself. You can't do enough good to make yourself righteous. Romans 3, Paul said these words, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are justified. Justified means that God puts his righteousness on us. You are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. That means we are all sinners. Say it with me. I am a sinner. You have to recognize that to be a Christian. You have to recognize it. And for those of you sitting out there that didn't say, I am a sinner, but you said, he's a sinner, well, then you're a sinner, all right? Just in case you're wondering. Um, the word sin is basically missing the mark. So God's mark is perfection. God says the only way that you can have righteousness, the only way that you can have heaven is you have to be perfect. Well, you can't be perfect. I can't be perfect. We already said that doesn't exist. But the perfect sinless son of God in the form of Jesus came to this earth, lived a perfect life, gave his life on the cross, died. Three days later, he rose again. And through his blood, through him, we can now have a relationship with God. It's a good place to say amen, just in case you were wondering, all right? Try it again. That's, a, that's how we can have a relationship with God. Look, that was really cool. I didn't even prompt you at all. That was really good, all right? So those are three. Here's the fourth one. Um, there will be a payment due one day. One day there's going to be a payment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says these words. He said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. I need you to understand this. And, and I want you to get this if you're somebody who's sitting on the fence and you say, I'm not sure about Christianity. One day, one day you're going to stand before God. Um, I'm not going to stand before God for you. Your mama's not going to stand there. Your daddy's not going to stand there. Your daddy's daddy's not going to stand there. If your grandfather was a preacher, he's not going to stand there. If your grandma was a Christian, she's not going to stand there on your behalf. You're going to stand before God one day. Everything you've done in this life, you'll have to stand before God for. Now, here's the cool thing. Once you've given your life to Jesus, there's now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But there is going to be a judgment one day. It doesn't get talked a lot about in churches anymore because we get a little nervous. I get a little nervous sometimes. I don't want to pick on the wees. I'm a, I'm a wee. Um, the Bible specifically speaks of a place called heaven. Oh, man, I've done an entire sermon series on heaven. 
about how wonderful it's going to be and you've heard streets of gold and, and, and gates with pearl and all the beautiful things that are going to be in heaven and, and the, the sea that's going to be crystal clear and all the things and heaven's going to be beautiful. The most beautiful thing about heaven is that Jesus is going to be there and we're going to spend eternity with him and there's going to be angels around the throne and they're going to outdo each other singing worship songs. They only got a couple of words they say, holy, holy, holy. That's a pretty good worship song. That's what they're going to do for all of eternity as they're already doing. Heaven is beautiful and it's going to be amazing and for those of us who surrender our lives to Jesus and give him our life and recognize that we're sinners in need of him, we'll be in heaven together one day. Even the Methodist. If they go the same way we do. The Pentecostals will be there, and I'm going to probably hang out in their section because they're going to shout really good. It's going to be great. Actually, I think we shout better sometimes. But anyway, it's all good. Um, but as much of a reality as heaven is real, the alternative to heaven is hell. See, God created hell for the devil, for the demons that followed the devil because of pride and stepped up and wanted to take the place of God. God created it for that. God doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go to hell, but God created it for the devil and for his followers. And for those of you that do not give your life to Jesus, eternity exists for you one day as well. One day, you will either spend eternity in heaven. Eternity is a long time, in case you're wondering, okay? That's forever. You're either going to spend an eternity in heaven, or you're going to spend an eternity in hell. The Bible describes hell as a place of fire. It, it describes it as a bottomless pit, the sensation of falling all the time. It describes hell as a place of darkness, as a place of sulfur, as a place that worms don't die, and they're forever on you as a place that you're not going to go down there and party with your friends. You're going to be in complete loneliness and suffering for all of eternity. That's what the Bible describes as hell. One day, one day there's going to be a payment due for all of us. The fifth thing you need to believe if you're going to be a true follower of Jesus is this. Jesus died for your sin to reconcile you to God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on, on which you have taken your stand. By the gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the words I preach. Otherwise, you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of his brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are living at the time of this writing, though some have fallen asleep or have died. Jesus came to this earth, he died for you to reconcile you to God. If you don't know what reconciliation is, we talked about it last week, you need to download that sermon and listen to it. He made you in a place and evened up the fact that you can have access to God. The sixth thing is this, now this is one that people, especially since COVID happened on this crazy earth we live on. People that said after COVID, church is optional. I don't have to go to church. I can get online and I can tell you that right now, if you're at home, you can watch, you can watch me online. We broadcast online, although I'm not sure if it's working this morning because we had the crazy demons in our stuff. But there are thousands of preachers all over the world that are broadcasting online, and people are staying home. People got, especially after COVID, they said, ooh, I can watch this preacher and this preacher, and I can learn from this one, and I can learn from this one. But we need to understand this, and we need to believe this if we're going to be Christians and followers of Jesus. The church is God's plan A, his body to reach the world, and there isn't a plan B. There's not one. And you may be saying, oh, I can be part of the church and just hang out at home. No, you can't. Look at Paul. He says, just as one body, though one has many parts, all of its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized into one spirit to form one body, whether Jews, Gentiles, slaves, free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. If the foot should say to the hand, I don't belong to the body, that's a creepy body, all right? It would not, uh, it, it would not for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not be for the reason to stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, listen to these words. God has placed the parts in the body. If you are a Christian, hear me say this, you can be mad, you can leave. If you happen to be listening online, you can say, I don't agree with that. And it's not me you're not agreeing with. It is God that you're not agreeing with. 
God says, if you are a Christian, you are a part of a body. You have a place and a purpose in a local church. If you are not coming to church on a regular basis and you have not become, in our case, an owner, maybe you're a member at another place, if you have not taken your life and said, I am going to be part of the body that Christ has in a local place, you are sinning and missing God's very best for your life. God's plan A is the church. Well, what about this mission organization and this mission organization? They are fantastic. We support them and we go with them. But without the local church, none of that exists. Matter of fact, Jesus' words when he talked to Peter just a few minutes ago, he said, on this I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. I don't know if you know this about gates, but gates don't charge. It's the church's job to charge the gates of hell. And we do that every way we possibly can. Plan A, there is no plan B. All right? Number seven, that means I got two more. Number seven is this. Jesus' followers are multipliers. That means it's our responsibility to go. Matthew 28, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some still doubted. Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, sit on your butts and don't do anything for me. Oh, shoot, I must have read that wrong. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. It is our responsibility to go. It is our responsibility to make disciples. It is our responsibility to teach them. By the way, teaching them is not a one-time, oh, here's Jesus, let's go away. It is staying part of their lives. The reason that when Amy came out and she talked about the fact that she got to go to Africa, the reason she went, the reason we had a team that met this past Wednesday, and we're going to send more people to Africa, and there's some of us that are going to India, and there's some that are going to Mexico. The reason we're doing these things is not so we can be Christian tourists to see the world. It's to obey what Jesus said. And that's to be multipliers. That's to go out and tell people about Jesus. And some of you are going, well, I'm not going on a mission trip. That's awful scary. Fine. You got neighbors. Talk to them. You can go there. You don't have to get on a plane, a bus, a train, or anything else. Walk across the road. Tell people about Jesus. Jesus' followers are multipliers. And here's the last thing that you have to believe if you're going to be a follower of Jesus. The Bible. The Bible documents God's redemptive words and activities in the world. If you were here Easter Sunday, we were doing a series entitled To My Friend Who Left the Faith. It was based on a book. And the message that Sunday I shared was, you don't have to believe all of the Bible in order to be a follower and give, excuse me, in order to be, give your life to Jesus. Now listen carefully. And I, I love making people question. Um, I said, you don't have to believe it all. What you do have to believe is that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Now, that's what it takes to become a Christian. Now, if you're going to be a faithful follower, you got to believe this thing. <laughs> this is God's word. It's been handed down. And you go, well, what translation should I read? Whichever one you'll read, that'll be fine. Listen to these words of Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you've learned, have been become convinced of, because you know those from whom you've learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says these words, all scripture is God-breathed or inspired, and scripture is useful for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped in every good work. Those are eight things that I gave you. Those eight things are sound doctrine. Now you notice I didn't talk about drinking or dipping or chewing or running around with girls that are doing. All right? I didn't talk about that. I talked about eight beliefs of what it is to be a Christian and to follow Jesus. That is doctrine. And if you don't believe those, you're not a Christian. If you're doubting any of those, ask the questions. Dig into this and grow. Let, let me wrap up this way. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, I read it just a little while ago. Paul said these words to Timothy. He said, the goal of this command is love. Listen, I know a lot of people. Goodness gracious, God, forgive me for my thoughts. I know a lot of people who have a whole lot of knowledge. I mean, so much knowledge, they got like master brains. Their heads are so stinking big, and the first thing they want to tell you is what their pedigree is every time you meet them. 
I know some people who say, I have more knowledge than you have. I know stuff. I've gotten this, 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 and this, and I've read this, 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 and this, and I know more than you do. But they got about that much love in their entire body. Paul says, all of this knowledge, you need the knowledge. But if it's not motivated by love, matter of fact, the love chapter is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. A lot of you had it quoted in your wedding if you had a Christian wedding. Paul says these words at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's not going to be on the screen. He said, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I had the most incredible orator voice in the entire world that kept you all encaptured by my voice, if I spoke with the words of men or maybe even angels, which I can't even imagine what their voices are, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, Paul said, if I have not love, I am like a clanging cymbal. Or a loud gong. This is Paul's version of more cowbell. (laughs) Paul said if there's not love, you might as well just constantly beat on the cowbell. So, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Let me give you this. Christians pursuing knowledge, motivated by love, that's the ones worth following. And by the way, If you're a Christian this morning, this needs to describe you. Did you know that nowhere in Scripture does it say you can be a part-time Christian? Nowhere in Scripture does it say, well, I'm just going to buy into this and only get enough. No. You're either a Christian or you're not. You're either somebody who says, I'm a leader and I'm going to lead other other people to Jesus, or you're somebody that says, I don't quite believe in all of this, and you're stepping back. There is no in-between. I love and I believe that there are gray areas. There's black, there's white, and there's some gray areas. But I am telling you the truth based on God's word and what I'm saying. If you do not believe the things that I share with you this morning, and you are not actively living them out with love in your life, you're not following Jesus. You're not. Let's let the Holy Spirit do whatever he wants to do with that. I said last week, and we're going to continue to do this in the weeks to come, I don't ever want to just give you something and not give you something to do with it, okay? So let me give you some next steps, and then I'm done. Kyle's going to come out. Next steps, throw them up on the screen for me, and I'll just read them off the screen with you guys. Next steps, number one is this. Are you pursuing knowledge, and are you motivated by love? Are you, some of you are going, well, I come to church to get knowledge. Nope, I ain't your mama, and you're not getting milk here anymore. It's meat, and you got to read it on your own, and you got to grow. Now, I want you to be at church, and I want you to grow, and I want you to encourage other people, but if you're a Christian, it's time for you to grow. We want you to come to church. We want you to experience what God has for you. We want you to worship together. We want you to be a part of a body. We want you to be accountable. We want you to be together with other Christians, but it is your responsibility to grow. So I'm asking you, are you pursuing knowledge, and are you motivated by love? Why or why not? The second one is this. Which one of these two? Do you need to work on? Are you somebody that goes, man, I know it. I know what the Bible says. I understand. Tony, I believe it. Man, everything you said is right. We're not going to let those people in the church, are we? Yeah. Or maybe you're somebody that has gone so far on the love side that you just want to go, love is wonderful. Everybody should be happy and we should just all get along and we don't need to tell anybody the truth. Nope. Love sends more people to hell than anything else because we won't Tell people the truth. There has to be the mixture. Which one of these two do you need more? Which one one of the two do you need to work on? And then here's the last thing for your next step. Throw that up there for me, guys. There we go. I want you to do this for me. We're going to do this together. You're going, I don't want to do that. Well, do it, all right? Quit being the gripey person. Just do it, okay? Download. Download this. Um, If you don't have the Bible app, it's U version, Y-O-U version. Um, download that app, and let's do this together. It's a seven-day um, read. It's got a devotion. It's got some scripture with it. It'll reiterate some of the things I said this morning. Uh, some of the days will actually explain it better than I did this morning. So they're going to leave that up here on the screen. So if you have version, go download it. If you don't, take a picture of that. Download version on your phone later. Let's read this together. Next Sunday, we'll talk about it for a minute or two. But download this and read it this week. Those are some next steps. Here's my last thing, and I'm going to pray, and Kyle's going to come out. My last thing is this. If you have any doubt that you're a follower of Jesus, please talk to us. Please talk to us. If there's anything we talked about this morning that you go, I'm not sure I believe that, 
Come talk to us. Don't leave today with a doubt. Traffic is too crazy this weekend for you to get in an accident and go into eternity. Please don't have a doubt. Come to Jesus. God, I love you. Thank you for your words. Thank you that you um, allowed us to speak this morning. Thank you, God, that you rescued us Oh, from, I don't know, everything in the world you rescued us. Um, God, help us to have sound doctrine in what we believe and in how we live and let it be driven by love, not by anger, not by meanness, not by pride, but by love. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen.